Is America under a covenant with God? Why has America become the nation that it is? The, the undisputed world leader. Um, why is that? It's not a coincidence. It's God's plan. But so what is this covenant? Well, that led to a whole bunch of other research. Basically, if you start off going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, first off, where was the Garden of Eden? Well, it was in Missouri. So when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, where would they have found themselves? Well, what is today the heartland of America? And there was this promise. In fact, the very first land of promise was named after Adam's great-grandson, Canaan. That's actually found in, in, in the um, book of Moses, okay, in the Pearl of Great Price. That this land of Canaan it says that it was the, land, the first land of promise. What was this promise? Well, the promise was essentially this. As long as the people were righteous, they could remain on the land. And if they became unrighteous, then God would have to remove them off of that covenant and promised land because God cannot allow wicked people to remain on this special piece of real estate. So we get down to the point where we have uh, Noah. The people become so wicked that God could not allow them to remain on this land. So he had Noah built the ark. And then the ark would have been built in essentially in what is now North America. And then he ended up of course, over in the mountains of Ararat, according to biblical sources. And he had his three sons, and then they, they spread out and so forth. And you had, if you follow the, the, the line of Shem down through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Jacob had his 12 sons. And then those 12 sons had got, well, let's, let's go back to Abraham for just a second. So Abraham, because of an unflinching righteousness and obedience to God, and even being willing to sacrifice his own son, um, Isaac, he was blessed with very, for, with a very specific set of promises. Oftentimes we call it the Abrahamic covenant. But that covenant actually existed prior to Abraham. It's an ongoing covenant. And, the, uh, and, and basically that covenant has to do with four specific things. Number one is that covenant, Abraham was blessed that, that uh, he would be given the land. In fact, in Genesis it says, all the land, he says, look to the north, south, east, and west, as far as you can see, to this land to will I give it to your posterity forever, it says. Well, how long is forever? <laughs> it's a long time, right? Okay, so this, this so this the, the land was actually one of the very important parts of the covenant. And then the second thing he said was is that there we're going to be blessed, we're going to bless you with the Lord's going to bless Abraham with posterity. Because one of the greatest blessings that God can bestow on any of his children is children. It's the closest we become to being a god. As much as science has tried to create life, they have never been able to do it. But yet, if we utilize the, uh, the, the powers that God has put into our bodies, we're able to create life. It's an amazing thing. And then the third thing is, is that he blessed them with, with prosperity. That their flocks and their herds would, would, uh, would, would uh, do well. You know, that they would... Uh, that they would prosper upon the land, and their flocks and herds would multiply, and so forth, and their and their and you know that they would do well uh, financially. And then the the fourth thing is said that they would bless them with security. I, I like to call it God's iron dome, His shield of protection will be over that promised land and that promised covenant people. As long as they are righteous, God would literally fight their battles for them. And uh, and and so and, and why was God going to do all this? Well, he told Abraham this. He said, "What? It, it's kind of a covenant. Well, it is, it is a covenant with, with, with man and between man and God. This covenant is basically this. God says, I'm going to give you these blessings, but in return, I need you to do something for me. What is that one thing, that one critical aspect, the one reason why all these blessings are going to be given to the people, the covenant people on the promised land? It has to do with one thing. And that is missionary work. It's all about, this covenant is all about missionary work. Now, people say, well, well, what do you mean? What do you mean this is about missionary work? Well, in order to have a very powerful missionary force, what, do you, what blessings are you going to need to have? Well, first off, you need the land. Why the land? Because God needs to establish a covenant, or a, I should say a, um, a society of righteousness. A culture of righteousness. 
And so how many times in the scriptures has he done that? He's led his, his covenant people out of the, the civilization, the culture that they were in, which was not conducive to the gospel. He led them out of that culture and then reestablished them in a separate land where they could establish this culture of righteousness. Okay? So then after they establish a culture of righteousness, then he's going to bless them with children because the gospel has to be, you know, go out, okay, heart to heart and spirit to spirit. And so it's going to require people touching other people. So God says, I'm going to bless you with the children that you're going to need to, to be effective in this. And the third thing, having missionaries is not cheap. <laughs> it takes money. It takes a huge amount of the budget of the church to run the missionary program. And even and, and families as well. So he knows they're going to need to have the financial capability to be able to go out and do this. I mean, some, some members of the church in third world nations are so poor that they can't literally cannot go on missions because they can't afford to be taken out of the workforce to earn whatever little bit of money they need to have so that their family can just survive. So in the promised land, God says, I'm going to bless you with the prosperity that you need. So you don't have to worry about that too much. And then the fourth thing is going to bless them with security. Because if the nation is under attack, if it's at war with other nations, then these young people would not be able to serve missions. They would have to serve instead military. So God says, I'm going to bless you with these four blessings. But then, using those blessings, I need you to go out and bless the other nations of the earth with the blessings of the gospel, which he said to Abraham, which are the blessings of life eternal. And that's why I personally believe that this nation was established. And we already know that, that, that God had a hand in the establishment of this nation because the founding fathers and so forth, he said that he raised up men for the very purpose of establishing this nation. That's never been done in any other nation at any other time that I'm aware of, at least not from the scriptures. There's, this, is, this is the one. If that's the case, and then, and then who also made the Constitution? Well, the Lord actually takes complete credit for the Constitution in section 101 of the Doctrine of Covenants. He says, I, the Lord, have established the Constitution of this land for righteous purposes and so forth. So, so I mean, he, you know, so he raised up the men and he established the Constitution. And what was the main purpose of that? What happened shortly after the Constitution and the establishment of our nation? The gospel was restored. It couldn't have been restored anywhere else. It was restored on this promised land, the land that was under a covenant with God. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that this covenant with God is to take the missionaries all out to the na nations of the earth. But the bottom line is, is that this, this, this covenant with God is, is so important, not only for members of the church, but for every American to understand. Because along with that covenant, along with those blessings, come very specific judgments of God on a nation that rejects him and turns their back on God. And interestingly enough, the Book of Mormon and the Bible give us very specific uh, instances, for example, where the people have turned their back on God. What's interesting is that these covenant people on this covenant land, when that happens, God, in his infinite mercy, tries to turn their hearts back to him. But he can't force us to do things, so the only thing he can do is to start to withdraw those blessings. So the first thing he does, and interesting enough, he always does this scripturally in reverse order. So the first thing he allows is that uh, uh, their, he, take, he takes away their security, a breach of their security. This happened, for example, in 722 BC when the Assyrians came in and attacked the northern tribes of Israel. who were the covenant people on the covenant land. The Assyrians come in, they attack them and so forth. Um, then it also happened with the Babylonians then in the, in the southern kingdom right after Lehi left. Then if that doesn't humble the people and return their heart to him, then he has to go to what I, I call it phase two. He has to start to take away their prosperity. So in the, in, the, in the case of the Book of Mormon, for example, it talked about how their riches became slippery and they couldn't hold on to their riches. They're just, you know, they, 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 they just start to not prosper. Their flocks and their herds don't prosper like they were their, their, their trees and their fields and their fruit and so forth. It, it just, things don't work. There's either like drought, and famine and so forth goes into that. And if that doesn't humble them and return their hearts back to God, then he has to go to phase three, which is basically take away their posterity. 
which usually means war and people die. And if that still will not humble them, if they still harden their hearts against God, then he has to basically go to stage four, which is they're swept off the land. So if the United States is this covenant nation, is there any indications of these things happening in our nation today? Well, on 9-11, we had a breach of our security the first time that our nation was actually attacked on its own soil. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, what about uh, Pearl Harbor and so forth? But you have to understand that Hawaii was not a state at the time when Pearl Harbor was attacked, so it was not officially part of the United States of America as a state. But New York is, is definitely that. <laughs> okay. um, then then uh, what happened eight years after that, or seven years after that, almost to the day, was the biggest stock market crash in United States history. 2008 stock market crash. Um, and there's other, then there's just, there's so many interesting things that indicate that the, this United States is the promised land. And the warnings in the Book of Mormon are specifically for this nation. So basically, my, my process of, 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 you know, identifying the actual lands of the Book of Mormon and so forth um, started with the DNA, and then went into what Joseph Smith, you know, knew, and then, and then kind of uh, into this whole covenant relationship. Uh, these two promised lands, there's, you know, these, which by the way are interesting because there's only two promised lands that were mentioned by Jesus Christ when he was with the Nephites there in 3rd Nephi, in, in, in the land of Bountiful. Um, and that is Jerusalem is one of the promised lands, and the new Jerusalem is the other one. And these are the two covenant and promised gathering places for the house of Israel, even in the last days. And that's also very interesting because there was a Pew Research report that came out about uh, two or three years ago that said out of, I think it was uh, uh, three and a half million Jews worldwide, something on the order of about 88 or 89 percent of them live in one of two nations, the United States and Israel. So truly, the Jews are already virtually all gathered to the two promised lands. It's already done. The gathering of the house of Israel, the, the Jews to their promised lands, is already practically completed. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, that, that case. 